The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Coffee with Cluffy. Bob Hot Rod Roar, your trainer today. Um, <clears throat> this is a topic that we're going to talk about today, safety devices for hydronic and plumbing systems. We haven't covered this topic before, so uh, I'm not going to lie. I learned quite a bit um, doing the research for this topic, so I hope you find it as interesting as I did. So, all right, today's topic. So, what I wanted to do is take a look at all the different safety devices that you see in the uh, plumbing and hydronic uh, field in the industry out there. Now, as I started getting into this, I realized that some of these devices are going to be required by a manufacturer when they sell you a product, like say a boiler, for example, that will come to you with a valve on it. A water heater typically is going to be a valve that was a uh, size and specified for the um, for the product. Uh, some of the valves that we'll talk about today have to do with temperature and pressure, like a TMP type of valve on a water heater. Some will be pressure only. Um, we're going to talk about valves that would require a low lead um, certification if they're used on domestic water. Um, some of the valves will be uh, for flow control, for safety devices, as well as uh, activation devices, backflow preventers. I consider that a safety device to protect the uh, domestic water in the building. Uh, vacuum breakers, anti-siphon on water heaters, we're going to talk about that a little bit, and then temperature control devices, thermostatic electronic mixing valves, like I mentioned that Kevin will be talking about in more detail next month, but I'll cover that a little bit. And then some of the other valves, not typically a listed safety valve, might be a, a boiler uh, anti-condensation valve for a boiler or something like that, so maybe a bit off more than I could chew here. I started out with this topic thinking, gosh, what could I talk about for an hour at safety valves? And then as I started looking into it, uh, it got to, to grow in quite a bit to be a pretty good sized topic, so I'll try not to move too fast here. One of the things that I, I wanted to start with is, you know, when you are a doctor, or you're in a medical profession, you kind of take an oath, you should take an oath, a Hippocratic oath that, uh, you know, you're going to protect the nation, you're going to make sure that you do your um, job to the best of your ability. The same thing applies to our trades. I know as I look over the list today, I recognize some of the engineers, some of the plumbers uh, on board that are watching today. I know when I took my master's test in that, we took an oath that we would protect the health of the nation. So a lot of that has to do with um, some of the devices we'll talk about like backflow prevention and stuff like that. And certainly if you're a licensed engineer, if you're an engineer that uh, belongs to the uh, ASME, uh, you also have a code of ethics that you follow. So um, this is a pretty important topic from you know the safety of all the people that we work for that we want to protect and uh, also uh, make sure that our industry is uh, well represented in that. So one of the things that I did as I started looking at this, I started looking at all the different standard and listings that you typically see on, on valves and components out there, and it, it's a big list, a lot bigger than I expected when I first started that. And I actually went to every one of these uh, websites, and this was the, the learning experience for me. I learned a lot just by going to all these websites and learning who they are, what they do, who makes up the boards, how it all works, and stuff like that. And I won't read off every one of those, but if you go through there, you'll see some of these are familiar to you. Um, ASME is certainly one of the big biggest ones in the very industry as far as pressure vessels. Uh, some of them might be new names to you. What I learned and what I discovered as I went through these different uh, lists, and probably there's more than this, I don't know that I've got every one on there, certainly remind me if I missed one there. Um, some of them um, reciprocate, like if you get one listing it'll cover um, like an ANSI and F standard, they, they kind of do different groups, but they work together on some of the listings for no lead, for example. So another thing I learned that some of these are being uh, consolidated. Uh, if you go down towards the bottom there, IAPMO has always been the code officials. They developed the code books, the UPC, the Uniform Plumbing Code, Uniform Mechanical Code, Electrical Code. Uh, they also develop standards. They used to be just a code book developing type of association, but now they actually have standards where we could send a product to them and they can list it. And as you, some of you probably know, they also are the uh, uh, they're in charge of the Radiant uh, RPA now, the Radiant Professional Alliance. So they've kind of expanded over the years into offering other uh, services and products and uh, again, taking over different associations. So um, the one that was really an eye opener for me was the bottom one there, the military spec and how that came about. And, um, you know, there's actually a spec for products that are used in the military and the defense industry, not just for our products, which would be plumbing and heating devices, but all sorts of electronic devices, everything. Uh, um, UL, probably the big name on there, most of you would recognize that from uh, appliances, your toaster, your dryer, your washing machine. Typically, that's going to be a UL listed product. Again, that started as mostly electrical uh, listings on products. It's probably the biggest in the world right now. 
them on their website, 22 billion UL marks appear on products right now. So they've branched out, they'll do um, products for the heating industry, they'll do all sorts of safety products, you know, uh, ropes, ladders, all sorts of things that you would see a UL listing on. So as I go through some of the products today, I'll explain a little bit more about how those listings came about, um, why they're important to us, they change from time to time. And so among us today, um, manufacturers I know are on the line today, some of the engineers that do uh, both uh, product development that would design a boiler, design a pump or something like that, and also engineers that might uh, be doing the drawings, drawing up the building, so uh, they would have to be aware of the different uh, safety requirements, different products, and of course reps and wholesalers and stuff. What I wanted to reach out here as I show you the group of people that we're, we're speaking to today is uh, get involved. You know, I, I follow quite a few different chat rooms online right now, different Facebooks and Instagram, and there's always be a little bit of a, oh, I'd say friction between the engineers and the installers and the plumbers saying, oh, you know, the engineers don't know what they're doing, and, and I hear the same from the engineers about the installers. Um, what I would encourage you to do is work together, and one way you can do that is when we develop these codes and standards and they get updated from time to time or they get changed and stuff like that, most of the time that you'll find all these different listing groups that I showed on the previous slides have the ability for you to get involved with a committee. It could be a working committee, it could be a technical committee, but that's how you get to have a say in our industry. It's just a lot like politics. If you don't like the direction it's going, then you have to get involved. You can't just be in the cheap seats complaining about it. So um, I've been involved in a couple of different groups over the years as a SME, a SME we call them, which is a sub a subject matter expert. So if you know a lot about a product, I happen to be involved with the uh, revision of the solar code and I've been doing that all my life so I knew a little bit about it so I offered my help to um, update the some of the solar codes that are out there so get involved you know you can do this at a local level too I know uh, for a couple of years I was on the the plumbers board here in my local town and as they adopted different codes they they brought plumbers and people together to uh, you know say okay what should we be changing what sort of amendments might we make to the code so um, Again, they're always looking for people to help, and the more people that get involved, the better our codes, the better our listings, the better our standards, and of course, the better our jobs. So, um, to make the long story long, let's jump right into some of the different products. So, I would say one of the most common products that you're gonna find out there if you're in the hydronic industry and also the plumbing industry would be a pressure relief valve. So what I tried to do here, I just went out in the shop and I had some of these valves, some of them are a little beat up on the tags, you can't read it. And I just pulled out um, three different typical uh, pressure relief valves that you'd see on a boiler. And I wanted to explain a little bit about what those tags are trying to, uh, trying to tell you, what all the different numbers mean, what all the information available on that. <clears throat> Probably the most common listing that you're gonna find, and then this is the ASME listing on that, that's usually a pressure vessel listing, and that's gonna appear, I got some better pictures coming up, is this little label right here. Most of the listing agencies will have a, uh, they call them a shield, a little thing that they'll either stamp or print on a tag like this. You can see there's the, the National Boiler Certification on this as well, the ASME. This valve is typically going to be sized and installed by the manufacturer. So when you buy a boiler, it's going to arrive to you with a valve that's been sized and specified by the manufacturer for the application that it's in. Now, certainly you could change that valve to a different brand someday if you had to do a repair or replacement. The important thing is that you size it properly. And I'm going to go into these numbers a little bit more. I think on the next slide, I probably got a clearer picture of what all these different numbers mean. Another thing important on a pressure relief valve is a discharge line. There's going to be a requirement for um, how that line has to uh, be sized, number one. You can't reduce the outlet port on this. It used to be they said these required to have a metallic piping. I think now they're, they offer uh, just a temperature rating. So if there's a plastic or another material that would meet the temperature rating, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a copper or steel metallic pipe. <clears throat> Required testing, now what you'll find is when you open the box in one of these valves here, there'll be a installation information on there. They might have a recommendation, a recommendation for testing a procedure, how often you should test that valve, what you should do when you test it, should you take it out, should you just lift the handle, what's their recommendation. You can see this has tamper-proof screws on it, so they don't really want you in here trying to uh, you know, work on that valve, clean it or change something like that. 
I also discovered that the testing um, that you see out there doesn't always line up from the manufacturer of the product to what the codes might require. I found that some say every three years you test this valve, some say yearly. You might have different requirements from an insurance carrier. If you've got a commercial building and your insurance inspector comes in from time to time, he might want to witness a test on this valve and certainly on a bigger commercial boiler or something like that. That might be uh, something that your insurance carrier might have the most stringent requirement as far as the testing requirement, what you have to do. Um, I guess the key here is just replace the valve with a like uh, capacity valve. No problem with oversizing the valve as far as the uh, capacity rating on it, but certainly don't want to undersize it. And um, the other thing on this valve, typically on this type of valve where it's a pressure only valve, they want them installed in this position here vertically. You don't want to put this valve on the side, out of the side of a, uh, a vessel and a horizontal mount so that you don't have fluid against the bottom of that diaphragm. So that again will be in the installation instructions on the proper way to install this valve on your, uh, your boiler. <clears throat> All the valves that we're gonna look at today, I would say this is probably the most common to everybody out there. This is a typical TMP, we call this temperature and pressure valve. This is gonna be on every water heater, every. Uh, a uh, tank that heats water, whether it's electric tank, gas-fired, um, could be a tankless uh, water heater, something like that. Different on this valve from the valve that we just looked at at the previous slide, it measures both temperature and pressure. So it's going to have a sensing probe that comes out of the bottom. That's going to be the temperature measuring uh, component of it, and also the spring and the diaphragm that works for the pressure. So this valve, once again, is going to be sized by the manufacturer. When they send a water heater out that has a burner of a certain capacity or electric elements of a certain wattage, that valve is going to be sized to be able to discharge um, the amount that that vessel can produce. Um, we'll look at how they rate that here in a second on, uh, on this little tag from the top, one of these. This valve can be installed in the side of a tank, like you see it here. This is in the horizontal mount only. So I don't know, let's see if this is the best picture I've got. I wanna talk about the different ratings on this valve. So in fact, let me look ahead one slide and see. Yeah, that slide's gonna be a little better. <clears throat> The tags on all these valves, you'll see there's quite a bit of information on these valves. Um, you're going to see different listings. In fact, this gets a little confusing. This is one of the things I learned uh, doing the research, why there's two different uh, BTU ratings on a valve like this and which one is the most important, which one would you go by. Uh, certainly model number information, um, all the different shields and different UL listings, ASME on this one, there's your national, uh, your HV shield from ASME, which is the pressure vessel seat shield that appears on there. Uh, let's see what else I have on that. Size and code requirements, yeah, the same thing as the boiler valve. But this one here, so the important thing about this type of valve, when you see this installed on a job, it has to be in the top six inches of the vessel, of the tank typically. So it could go in from the top vertically, like you see this little corroded picture here. It can go in the side, but the critical, um, thing to know about installing one of these, it has to be in the top six inches of the tank. That's going to be the hottest temperature. That's where water's going to go when it stratifies in like a tank type of water heater. It's going to be hottest at the top point. And the probe has to be immersed in the water. And why I say this is occasionally you'll see a, an installer will take this relief valve out and they'll put a T in place of that relief valve. Maybe you want to hook a recirculation pump in there. Maybe they're trying to access that top port for a combined system or something like that. If you put a relief valve back into the, the run of that T, you have to make sure that the probe reaches into it. So if you see over here on the side, there's a couple different ways that they're making these valves now to make it easier for you to make sure that you've got a valve that can reach into the tank. So if it happens to be a tank with an internal flue, your typical gas or oil fired uh, water heater, LP fired water heater, you have to make sure that the um, the probe on there is short, that it doesn't go in and you know, bump against it when you screw it in and hit the flue on the inside. So that'll be a typically a short probe. Now what's happening with the water heaters over the years is we're starting to meet the new energy standards. We're starting to put more insulation, more thickness around the outside of the tank. So now they make extended shank, um, like this little valve off to the side here, extended shank valves that will reach through the insulation to make sure that um, number one, you can get a wrench on them to take them out and replace them, but also that they reach through the inch and a half or two inch of the insulation that's on the outside of the tank um, to reach in, make sure the probe's in there. These long probe versions are available. Again, if you're gonna go in through the T in the side of a tank, you can get them with these uh, longer probes. I think uh, most of the brands order, offer at least four or five different lengths of long probes that you wanna go in there. So. 
most of the manufacturers are going to suggest uh, that you test this at least twice a year. A couple of them that I looked up say once a year. And when I say testing, what you want to do is go down and actually lift this valve. Of course, make sure you've got a discharge tube on it that's screwed in tightly so it doesn't pop off in your face when you lift it. And uh, make sure this valve discharges. Now, what you're going to find with these valves when you go around doing it is a couple things. Sometimes you're going to find a valve that looks like this, this is an actual valve from a, a job. And you go to open this valve to discharge and it won't open. In fact, I've had these valves where you actually rip this little um, sheet metal lever off the top trying to open it because it's been scaled shut. Now, that's obviously a valve that's going to need to be replaced. Don't even try to uh, clean that out and replace that valve. Um, just keep some of these with you on the truck. The other thing that you're going to find is a lot of times when you open this valve, if you do it yearly or whenever you go back and do this, it might not seal when you relieve uh, the pressure on this lever after you lift it up and what's going to happen is this little scale that you see that came from inside the water heater gets between the seat and the mechanism in here and now you've got a drip 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 or you might have a stream you might even have a spray so i would just encourage you to have a, um, a spare with you if you're going to pop these valves when you go to do a test <clears throat> because um, once it's dripping there's usually not a fix for that type of valve now the other thing that one of the manufacturers suggests is every three years that you take this valve completely out of the tank and inspect it because what will happen the same buildup that you're seeing here can actually build up on this temperature probe and what will happen then it can sense the temperature properly and you could have a valve that won't discharge when the temperature gets up to the uh, whatever the rating is usually 210 uh, degree on the temperature rating on that valve so that's why they say you need to physically take it out and see what condition that probe is i've also seen probes that when you pull them out they're actually starting to disintegrate a little bit maybe that's from aggressive uh, chemicals in the water something like that but obviously that would be a valve that would need to be replaced again the the requirement of the valve is the uh, pressure and the temperature now this valve used to be let me see i think the Maybe the previous slide shows us a little better. It used to be these valves when they're on the side of a water heater would have 125 PSI uh, temp uh, pressure rating on 210 degree F, obviously just under boiling temperature. And the standard used to say that 45% of what the vessel was tested for, most residential water heater vessels are tested at 300 PSI, well, 45% of that is what the valve has to read at. They've changed that just recently, and now they're saying 50% so if in fact the vessel has 300 psi 150 pound relief valve is um is what they're recommending for that vessel now <clears throat> now as we go through this listing over here this little tag that's on this valve notice a couple things on this there's a couple different uh, btu per hour ratings on this valve one is the csa the canadian uh standards association there that rates this valve you can send your valve up to that and they'll rate it and the other one here is the ASME. And I didn't know until recently, until this week, why there was two different ratings and what they meant. So I'll probably just read this since it's a little bit. So what they do is when ASME tests this valve, what they do is they'll test this valve and they'll set this valve, let's say this valve, what is it, set 75 PSI on this valve. So they're gonna test that vessel to discharge at that pressure so what that would mean, if you had a valve that was rated 75 PSI at, say, a million BTU per hour rating, that valve would have to go up, that tank would have to go up to that pressure, that 75 PSI, and discharge that amount of um, BTUs per hour to get that rating. Now, if you have this valve on a vessel that's not an ASME rated vessel for that kind of pressure, um, that rating is a little misleading. The interpretation I got, they suggest this number is a safer number to um, size the valve at because this valve here is tested to get this rating, the CS rating under a 15 PSI test. And then the steam that discharges at that test, when it gets to that temperature, they collect that and they measure it. And that's how they get the rating on that. So that's why there's such a discrepancy, such a wide difference between these two different uh, B2 per hour. This is a number that I uh, would tend to agree with is probably the more um, conservative number to size your valve at. This again, if you're using it in an ASME rated vessel, certainly this number would be acceptable there, but this as you can see is a quite a bit lower uh, rating on that valve with the CSA rating. So let me know if you have any questions on that and I'll make sure I got that explained properly. 
so now here's a valve, a couple of different valves. There's a, a little, again, probably not really a safety valve per se on an air vent like this, but what I wanted to show here more than the safety um, on the valve application for valve this is some of the listings. So if the valve is going to touch domestic water, it has to have a low lead rating on it. So typically it'll be a shield like this will be on the valve, and that will say that this valve has been tested to this standard up here, this ANSI uh, 372 standard we call it. I think 2011, Kevin, is the date on that when that standard and that will change from time to time if they update that standard. Typically, this will change, but the ANSI standard is this 372. So this is an example of a combination where the NSF, National Sanitation Foundation, and ANSI work together to develop the 272 standard. So what we as a manufacturer would do is we can take and send this valve to a couple different third-party agencies that will test this valve to that standard, and then we have the, uh, the approval or the permission to use the table of this uh, this listing right here. This is an example. There's a couple different listings that when, uh, can be used that will reciprocate on this. We could send this valve to UL, for example, and get a listing. We could send it to this group here. We could send this valve to IFMO and make sure that any one of those agencies could test it, give us permission to use their shield on it to this standard right here. <clears throat> now, in addition to that, there's some additional um, listings that might be required on it. And here's an example of a couple. The state of Vermont has S152. California has this new Prop 65 saying it's been out for a couple years. Um, these are in addition to this standard here. So if you work in those jurisdictions, the valve is going to have to carry these two uh, listings on it all. So this uh, Vermont listing, if you're there, California. And really what the Prop 65 is, it's just right here on the bottom. It's just a warning that has to be on the product, has to be on the box. And it's not really a, a, a listing standard per se where they test the valve or something like that. They just want you to label on it that this is the purpose that has to be on. On that so it's just another thing that a manufacturer now has to be aware of if you're going to sell your product in that market so I guess you would call that a safety warning you know that's more of a health warning certainly it's uh, it just proves to the owner to the building uh, that self has been uh, certified for that standard and of course anytime a standard like this gets developed gets put out there and then all these questions come out and some of the questions that come up well what about a boiler fill valve, for example? That touches domestic water, but typically the water doesn't come back through that valve and go back into the potable water system. Does that valve, uh, should that be tested to this standard? So there are still some gray areas in this, in this new standard that we're trying to uh, work our way through. So um, notice on this picture over here on our Z1 uh, zone valve series, this has a couple different standards. So the UL listing that's on this valve has to do with the electrical part of this for the actuator on this valve. It doesn't have to do with the brass body, although UL, Kevin tells me, could also test this valve for a low lead. So this listing would have a couple of different numbers on it that would say, okay, the body's been tested to the NSF uh, 61 ANSI standard there, as well as the electrical component, the switch and the, the wiring inside this has been uh, approved by UL. Make sense? All right, I would say of all the different devices that we're going to talk about today, all the different uh, switches and valves, I would say this is probably the most abused one that I've noticed. In fact, I was out in, uh, where was I last week, in Seattle, and we went to an apartment complex. I think we walked into probably six or eight different um, units there that had boilers making domestic hot water, and a number of them had uh, flow switches in them, and every one of them was duct taped shut, and no wiring was going out of that valve. So somebody obviously didn't understand the importance of this valve, what it does, how to adjust it, or um, how to size it or whatever, and they just bypassed it. And I, if I had a dollar for every one of these that I had seen out in the field that's been the wires clipped off, it has been taped shut, or it's been disconnected, um, I might not be here today. I'd be rich. So let me explain how this, uh, this type of valve works. So this is a flow switch. You can see some of the listings. Now this listing right here is uh, another listing. This is the um, uh, the shield, what we call the um, the CE, and this is has to do with products that are sold within the Europe uh, European account uh, economic area, I guess we would call it. And what this is really considered by them when you go to their website, this is kind of a passport that this product can really cross borders in Europe, can be used in a lot of different countries over there without having to go in through a listing in every single place that it goes. So this is a pretty a big umbrella listing. You'll see this on quite a few Calafi products because we are you know, uh, an Italian company, and so this listing really does a lot of, uh, covers a lot of mileage for us. And again, an electrical component on this, that's what the UL 
uh, listing is for. So let me explain a little bit about how this works and why it's so important that this gets um, put in properly. That seems to be the most common uh, problem with this valve is when they're not working in the field as they weren't installed properly. So this uh, flow switch here needs to go into this type of fitting. It needs to go right into the branch of a T. If you try and put this valve into like this here uh, configuration where I've taken a copper T, I've put a one inch female adapter, a couple things are gonna happen. Is number one, if you select the probe length, I don't know if you can quite see it here, and you cut that for one inch and you put it in this here, it's not gonna reach into this pipe here to get an accurate flow setting. You would have to kind of customize or adjust the length of the next longest paddle on that to reach into this far enough to be able to activate. The other thing that happens when you put it in either this here where I put a reducing bushing in it or you put it in this copper T uh, assembly that I built is this can rub on the side of this copper tube because it's meant to go right through the larger diameter of this uh, FIP connection. So if you have to go through the copper tube in here, you might find that this is gonna rub on the side of that tube and then it's not gonna activate. It might get stuck in the on position, it might get stuck in the off position, it might rub in there. The other thing that happens is the further away from the actual flow that I put the switch and the paddle, the paddle has to move a certain distance to activate the switch up. So the further away I get from this, I'm starting to lose my uh, angle dangle, I guess you would say, where I might not get that paddle to move far enough because I've limited the travel stroke in here by putting it out um, at a further distance. So you got to pay attention to the installation on this device. Um, we give you a lot of choices that most of the brands do on length of a uh, the paddle that gets cut for the size of the T that you put it in this. So if this was a six inch T, for example, you would go down to the six inch size here and that's where you would make the cut. Now, the other thing I want you to do too is when you start stacking them like this for a, a long, you know, long reach on a large diameter pipe, you want to stack them up like that. Don't just take the longest one and throw away all the other short ones. They need to be stacked up like this and uh, put in all at one and just cut it up to the length. So where this uh, flow switch is typically used, I see most commonly used on domestic water boilers. So this would be typically a copper tube boiler. And what this flow switch is gonna make sure that if there's no flow going through the boiler, that it cuts off this burner so you don't you know, just boil the water that's going through there. It has to have a certain amount of flow going through that boiler to make sure that you can you know, pull the heat out of that boiler as fast as the burner's making it. So you don't have an overheating condition, which of course could lead to a trip on the, uh, the relief valve. So. Other applications, sometimes you'll see them on the heat pumps where we're gonna trip off the heat pump on a pump and dump, for example. We wanna make sure there's flow going through there so we don't uh, overheat the uh, the loop and uh, trip out on high header on our compressor. So it's used in that application. Um, smaller ones, I think I got a picture on the next slide. You'll see them on tankless water heaters. When you turn on a faucet in your uh, in your home and you've got a tankless water heater, something has to initiate that uh, startup of that that heater, and that's typically where. In fact, let me see if I've got that. You'll see this little one right here. This I think is about a half inch side. We actually make these for the European market. I don't know that we uh, sell many of them here, but this is one you can see a very small paddle, a uh, very small pipe size and a paddle that goes down inside here. So any faucet, even a very low flow condition, like a half gallon a minute at a lav faucet or something like that, has to be able to activate that. So this panel is gonna fill up most of the space inside this piping. When you look down the bore, one of these, when this is, a uh, installed in there, you'll see that that paddle's taking quite a bit of the space because it has to be very uh, low flow condition that can activate that valve. So this is a valve you'll uh, see a lot in the tankless water heater. The same thing happens to this type of valve that I showed you with TMP valve. If you get a little bit of a lime scale buildup around the outside of this paddle or inside the body of this valve, um, then the paddle can't move freely in there and the valve might not activate or it might not worse, shut the, the flame off after there's no more water uh, flowing through the device. So this valve is gonna be another valve I would suggest or switch in this case that you take it apart from time to time and clean it out. If you're gonna do a deliming uh, procedure on a tankless water here, that would be a good time to take apart and inspect this. These are typically pretty easy to get apart, and reassemble. You'll see a little uh, gasketed, just a union threaded connection on here, just a, a straight thread so you can just unscrew them, uh, check them, clean them, put them back together. So a safety device as well as a, uh, a switch that would activate a call for heat or call for a, a burner to fire for domestic water call. 
Um, let me go back one slide here because I think I want to show. So this here again is a copper tube boiler and you'll see that's where this flow switch is going to initiate this burner call for heat. So this is going to assure that you've got enough flow going through that boiler so that when the burner comes on, you're going to make sure that you're moving the, the BTUs out of that boiler as it's being developed. This is probably the one that I see disconnected the most often and I think what happens is a couple of things is um, they get limed up in there so they can't move freely on a domestic water because this is seeing you know, new fresh water being added to it all the time. Uh, the other thing that happens with this, if the boiler itself starts to scale up inside there, that you're not getting adequate flow through the heat exchanger, the copper tube uh, heat exchanger, for example, then the switch doesn't see enough flow going through it, and it's doing exactly what it was intended to do. It's saying, no, I don't want the fire coming on, I don't want the, this burner to start up because I don't have enough flow going through the boiler, and I think that's the where people go in there and they'll try and adjust it or they'll think there's something wrong with it and uh, you know maybe from frustration or just happen to get the job going that seems to be when they disconnect this and just jump room or bypass the flow switch altogether so that's not the proper way to um, troubleshoot and repair a flow switch is trying to make an adjustment in there or, or bypass and jump across it. I don't know what else on that one. Now, if this was a hydronic boiler, you might have a, a circulating pump out here. That's, um, that pump is going to have to be sized to get the adequate flow through this um, to trigger that switch also. I've seen jobs where they've undersized the pump, and then they go in and they start jacking around with the flow switch, thinking there's something wrong with the switch, when in fact, they've undersized the pump that's out here that's intended to get enough flow through that boiler for that flow switch to make contact and uh, turn on the burner and initiate the call. By the way, thanks to the people that uh, us to use their pictures of their jobs uh, in our presentations here. I try to make sure I give credit to those folks as we go through here. Talked about that one. Let's see, how am I doing for time? <clears throat> All right, now another important safety device is temperature sensing uh, thermistor, this is called. So here's an example of a little boiler that I had out in my shop, and you'll see in here there's a couple different safeties uh, that are measuring temperature. So what you'll find on most of the new ModCon boilers, there's going to be one and usually two of these temperature thermistors, thermistors. And in this case here, one's me measuring the temperature coming into the boiler and the other's measuring the temperature going out. And so if I know both those temperatures, I've got a differential. And what I can do now that I know a differential, if my boiler is um, running outside of what the manufacturer recommends for acceptable delta the T through that boiler, it's going to trip off the um, trip off the burner. It's going to say we're not getting enough flow through this boiler. The boiler is going to overheat. It's going to start banging. Um, might go on the high temperature lockout. So by using two thermistors, I have the opportunity to number one monitor my temperature. If I've got an overheat condition because of my operating thermostat has run away or failed, this gives me a second level protection that I can um, see my temperature on the supply and call which is supply and return here I'll know my supply temperature so it can act as a safety device turn off the boiler it can also watch the delta T between them and uh, turn off the boiler if the delta T isn't adequate for the flow going through it a lot of these on the new boilers you'll see these in um, example over here in the uh, the flue connection on the back of the boiler so that's measuring the flue gas temperature if that exceeds the uh, the the requirement of the boiler manufacturer, it's going to trip off the burn and say you've got a blocked flue or you've got a, a plugged up heat exchanger that's causing the flue gas temperature to rise. So this is a very common uh, device used nowadays for a lot of different applications in uh, ModCon boilers. It needs to be installed in a dry well. Over here's a picture of a dry well with a thermistor that goes inside of it. This one here happens to be one that some of the ModCon boilers send this out as a uh, a component that's in the package, the installation package, and it's intended to be used in a domestic water indirect tank. So if you want the control on the boiler to operate the, uh, the temperature of your indirect tank, your domestic hot water, you can actually screw this sensor in the side of the tank and put the thermistor in it, wire it back to the boiler, and now this is what's um, regulating the temp instead of having a, a separate aquastat. A lot of installers like that because now when you wire this directly into the boiler control, you can do the data logging through that control because now it's actually into the microprocessor that's run on the boiler is also watching what's going on with your uh, temperature in your domestic water. A couple tips that I'll tell you on this type of uh, sensor, this type of safety or this type of a uh, thermistor is when you insert this thermistor into this brass drywall here, you should put some uh, 
heat transfer grease on that for two reasons. Number one, this isn't always a super tight uh, fit in here and you're dependent on the conduction of this thermistor, this little um, stainless steel body to this brass well and the brass well obviously in the fluid in the water in the glycol, whatever it might be going into. So you wanna make sure that you've got a good connection between those so the thermal grease goes around this when you slide it in there so you've got a good conduction uh, connection between that. And it also makes that someday somebody's going to have to replace or remove this, so the grease helps it um, come out uh, if you have to uh, take it out and replace it or check it someday. An ohmmeter is typically all you need to troubleshoot this here. In the back of most of the boiler manufacturers' manuals or our solar controllers, we use thermistors. You'll see a table that shows the uh, resistance reading and the temperature that corresponds to it. So sometimes these don't fail where they won't work at all, but the temperature is way off from what you suspect it should be. So uh, just putting your ohmmeter on that and comparing it to the chart in the back will tell you if it's, uh, if it's run out of its, uh, its accuracy range. All right, now this switch over here is a pressure switch. So in the same ModCon boiler, this is the header right on the side of the ModCon, this is gonna be a switch that determines the amount of pressure that's in that boiler. And I think most of them now come with probably an eight pound, maybe it's a little bit lower than that. I didn't take it out and look at it. But this is also being used as a safety. And basically what it's telling you, if for some reason there's a leak in the boiler and there isn't a makeup system on it and the pressure dropped in the boiler, this is gonna open and it's gonna prevent the boiler from uh, firing up. So I don't know if you can see in this picture, but these are actually all tied together in the uh, safety circuit in the string of uh, controls there. So if any one of these fails, um, the boiler will be uh, locked out so it won't, uh, won't fire, won't dry first, for example, if the water is drained out of it. Same thing with this type of device. I've seen these where the, if this is on a domestic water application, you get a little bit of lime scale in here, then the, the water isn't getting up to the little sensor. This is typically just a little diaphragm type of uh, pressure switch in here that can get plugged up that it's not reading the, the pressure in the boiler. Uh, again, none of these should be jumpered out and uh, you know taken out of the control, out of the safety string in the, in the boiler. Uh, what else I know of? I don't know, safety, yeah. All right, a low water cutoff switch, LWC is typically the acronym for that when you see it on a drawing or if you see it on a boiler piping schematic. So um, these are a couple that we had up in Milwaukee that we, uh, that we were playing around with, that we were testing. We we're doing some water quality testing with this is basically what we're doing. So the way this works is this probe goes into the fluid, the water, the glycol, whatever the fluid is in your heating system, and it just measures the conductivity of the fluid. And again, it's trying to tell you that if there's no fluid on this, it's going to lock out your boiler from firing. So some boilers will come with this in addition to the pressure switch that I just showed you on the previous slide. What I'm seeing more often is the boiler manufacturers are sending their boilers out now with a connection right on the terminal strip where you wire up the boiler for low water cutoff to be used in addition to the safety that they're supplying with the boiler out of the box right from the factory. I know in some jurisdictions, um, inspectors are asking you to put this device in on the job site as an extra safety. Um, uh, that's it. Yeah, I'll talk about that now. What you're gonna find as you look at all these different safety devices that are added on in the field that don't come supplied with the equipment, some of these are gonna be covered by code, like the plumbing code, the mechanical code, <clears throat> might require you to put additional safeties in. Sometimes you'll find the local jurisdiction, whoever's the, the inspector in your area might have a, made some amendments to the local uh, to the code that they use. Let's say they're using the UPC. They can put some amendments into that code at the local jurisdiction and say, well, we want all boilers that are, um, let's say, mounted above the radiation where they could get into a dry fire condition. If there's a leak in the basement, all the water could go out of that boiler. Now you've got um, a dry fire condition. So they might be requiring this low water cutoff switch in addition to the uh, switches that are provided with the boiler. So, um, a lot of different brands out there, a lot of different sizes. What I've noticed also, is some of these now are multi-purpose, that this valve that's also serving as a low water uh, cutoff switch can also do some other um, temperature monitoring, maybe fire in the boiler, it could be a combination type of device. Same thing applies to this here. This little probe that's sensing the uh, conductivity of the water needs to be clean, and this brand right here, I think that's the indication of, uh, or that's the intention of this little plastic clip on there that actually spins and moves around there and keeps the end of that probe clean so you've got a good uh, temperature, or a good reading of the conductivity of the water. Um, 
what else on that? Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much everything you need to know about low water cutoff switches. Oh, important, I guess important too, is where you put this. This is usually gonna be put at the highest point in the piping system. So if you come out of the top of, let's say a ModCon boiler, for example, you wanna put this up above the highest point in that piping. So that as soon as the water starts to leave that point, obviously you don't wanna put it below the boiler on the side of the boiler because you could leak uh, enough water out of that system that you can still have a, a drier fryer condition. Again, follow the installation uh, instructions that come with these devices. All right, hopefully. So backflow preventers, a safety device in the fact that it pr protects the water that's coming into your building um, from a backflow condition. So you'll see these commonly on lawn sprinklers, you'll see these on boilers, you'll see these on uh, fire protection systems where they're connected to the potable water system. There's different types of these out there. Um, this type right here that we offer now called an RPZ, reduced pressure zone. Um, this is a testable type. You can see these little ports here where you can come and put a delta P meter on that and confirm that this valve is, um, is working properly. A lot of jurisdictions are requiring these to be tested yearly to make sure that they're working properly. Um, a check valve is a similar device. I mean, this really is a little bit more sophisticated check valve is basically what you have there that's um, testable. Uh, check valve can be used for preventing backflow conditions. Uh, this is another version that we offer of a dual check with a vent. Um, what we're finding is more and more jurisdictions are, are starting to go to this type, a little bit more, a little higher level of protection, um, a testable device with the, uh, with the PT parts on it. Interesting, I was down visiting uh, my uh, nephews here. Uh, weeks ago down in Florida, and all three of my nephews down there work for fire protection companies, and they're certified black backflow uh, testers, and they uh, they do that on, on jobs where they uh, put in fire protection, but also for landscaping, and we happen to be at his house on a Sunday, and uh, the dog starts barking, looks out front, and there's a guy walking through the neighborhood, he's got a little tool kit, he's got a little uh, kind of clipboard with him, so Alan goes out and says, okay, who are you, what are you doing, and he was there on a weekend going around testing backflow preventers on lawn sprinklers as he, the, the uh, homeowners association had hired him to go out and uh, go around and test all the backflow preventers and sign off on them, and uh, so Alan starts asking the question, he goes, gosh, you're only over that job for 10 minutes, how did that one come out, because he didn't tell him who he was or that he was a certified backflow uh, prevention tester and uh, like anything there's I think uh, he was just going around stamping these is okay without even putting the meter on and testing them so even the best intention here that we you know make these testable that there's a standard that there's a, a code requirement for how often they have to be tested there's still people out there it seems uh, just gaming the system and just signing off on these without even testing them so um, if you see these, you know, it's a good idea to take the certification. IAPMO offers training for that, by the way, if you want to be backflow uh, certified uh, to test these and uh, sign off on them. Uh, what else on this type of thing here? This check valve, since we're talking about it, I like to see this type of check valve used in hydronic applications. This is a conical seat spring type of check valve. It gives you a near bubble free seal. So if you want to make sure that you don't have ghost flow or if you have a job that has ghost flow in some of your zones, this is a little, um, you can see it's a union type of check valve that we offer for hydronics that has a nice tight seal to it, it has a spring a check mechanism. And so let us know if you can help you with something like that. All right, vacuum breakers. I learned a lot about vacuum breakers too. This is something that I know what a vacuum breaker is. I've, in fact, these are some that I had in my shop here. Um, I'm familiar with these on restaurant equipment, a lot of dishwashers, commercial dishwasher, you see a vacuum breaker. So this is intended again, so that the, the water out of the dishwasher can't go backwards into the, um, into the potable water system. That's why this one's chrome plated. It's typically an exposed valve that you'd see in there. Um, you'll see these on hose bibs. Here's a little vacuum uh, preventer, vacuum breaker on a, a little uh, hot and cold hose bib that I've got in the side of my, my tiny home here. You can see the mechanism on this. So same intention there. If you've got a hose in a mud pile or something like that, you've got a, a condition back here where the water's um, been shut off or the mains being drained, you don't want to suck that in there. So um, what I learned about this, there's, a, there's two different ways that these protect the system. And let's see. Covered all here. Let me go to the next slide. I think it shows a little better. So there's a couple different things that you're trying to protect with that type of device. Number one, you don't want to subject the tank to a, a, net, a negative uh, sub-atmospheric condition. So let's say you had a job where um, you had a water heater on the second floor of a home and the uh, pressure was dropped off on the main and um, you don't want to 
uh, implode or collapse a water heater. Now, to be honest with you, in my lifetime of doing this, I've never seen a domestic water heater implode from a, a negative pressure. You know, a tank is uh, designed for 300 pound positive pressure, but it certainly can't take that on a negative pressure. There'd have to be some pretty uh, unique situations to see a negative condition pulled on a water heater to the point that it collapsed. That being said, as I searched around the internet, I did see some examples of water heaters with the, uh, when they took the jacket off, the the tank had actually been collapsed and sucked together, so to speak, from a negative pressure condition. So the other thing that we're protecting against is anti-siphon. So if there was some condition in the building that, the, again, the water was uh, shut off and um, somebody opened the faucet, we don't want to be able to siphon the water out of a certainly gas-fired or electric-fired water heater that we could, again, dry fire that device. So one of two ways that you can protect that from happening is um, in this picture over here, thanks to the folks at the uh, Cameron Plumbing Services. Um, they tell me in Massachusetts these are required on all tanks, so that's a little um, vacuum breaker there that prevents, again, the subatmospheric condition from being developed in that tank, but also uh, that tank from being siphoned out and running dry. What I learned is most of the new water heaters, a tank a type of water heater that has top connections, actually have an anti-siphon function or device built right into the anode rod. So that little device right there, that little hole in the side of the anode rod, once the water drops below that level, that's where you break the siphon. So that would prevent a top-mounted water heater from being siphoned dry <clears throat> by just having that little break in it, which from the way I read the 2015 UPC code, that this can substitute for having the uh, separate vacuum breaker on it, <clears throat> like I showed this picture here. Now, that being said, if you have this type of water heater where you've got side connections, then you do have to have this type of event that's shown in this picture over here because there's no way, obviously, since there's no connection on the top of this tank, to put an anode rod with this little siphon breaker in there. Um, that's where they want to see the additional. So I don't know how your code, your local code official is going to interpret that. Um, what is that number? I think it's 504.1 in the code book, at least in the UPC code book. Um, they're saying an anti-siphon device is a dip tube is acceptable for that. And 504.2 says a vacuum relief valve needs to be uh, installed on any bottom or side feed water heater uh, connected to a potable water needs to have that device. And then over here needs to be listed to the ANSI Z21.22 um, is the standard that that valve has to be uh, tested and certified and approved too. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense that I, now what I would suggest is how would you know if your water heater has this type of device in it unless you take it out? Um, from my understanding of what I've read from the water heater manufacturers websites that these are included and all, I don't know if that's a certain point in time when they started doing that, but um, certainly no harm in adding an additional device if you, if you feel it's necessary. One of the interpretations I saw, they said, well, we're only going to require that if the water heater is on the second story of a building, that it can drain completely out to the lower level. If it's on a, uh, a grade level application, it's uh, so I don't know how you're going to keep that straight. What you're going to find with all these things where there's a, uh, a code written for this, not only does the code dictate what you should be doing and that's what you need to follow, but it really sometimes comes down to the actual inspector that comes to your job site and how he interprets this, for example, this 501, 504.1 and 504.2 anti-siphon device as opposed to vacuum relief valve. You know, he needs to be aware of what the difference is, what the the you know the function of this is compared to this device here how would he know if that's in there so your inspector might just you know err on the side of uh, caution and require you to put this additional valve on the outside of it obviously it has to be above the tank uh, when it's installed <clears throat> so that's the two different devices that can protect against a uh, back uh, anti a siphon uh, issue as well as a, a negative pressure condition Two different things while I'm talking about that, you know, anti-siphon, you can siphon a water heater out, but you have to allow air into a tank. It's like when you take a, a, a gas can and you tip it completely over. Unless there's a way for air to get into that, the gas isn't going to come out of that. So that's what this type of device will do. Now, to have a negative condition where you could implode or collapse a tank, that system has to be sealed. And that's how you develop the negative. You can't develop a negative pressure condition if, there, if you have a faucet open, for example, or if you... Uh, you know, crack the nut on one of your supply connections on the top of your water heater. Now you can siphon it out, but you won't develop a negative condition if the tank is um, is open to atmosphere somewhere through a connection or through a faucet or something. So that's kind of the difference between a negative uh, pressure condition and a uh, siphon condition. All right. 
so yeah, this is just a little uh, solar uh, pressure relief valve that we offer that we make. Um, what you'll find on the top of this, I can't quite see it there, but you'll see a BTU per hour rating on this. Most of the valves that we would sell, I think this is probably the only pressure relief valve that we have in our offering right now is uh, this little solar valve will probably have the CE mark on it because again, it's a global product. What you'll find with a lot of those marks where they cross the ocean, for example, is they reciprocate that standard. Um, I think we found that this standard for the CE uh, listing on this actually exceeds the standard that we use uh, uh, in the US, maybe the ASME standard or that other CSA that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So um, when in doubt, I guess, ask your local authority if they'll accept the, um, the mark that's on it as a, uh, an equal standard. What do we got here, 1253, and I think we can pull this off. Um, probably one of the most critical uh, safety devices for protecting homeowners would be a temperature control or temperature uh, mixing valve. Thermostatic mixing valves are probably gonna be one of the most common valves that you see installed on water heaters these days. Pretty simple device, mixes the hot and cold, blends it down to a certain temperature. Standards for this valve, you're gonna have the uh, a 1070 and the 1017 standard. One's gonna be for the point of um, distribution. This valve would be installed at the water here with the 1017 standard. The 1070 standard is the valve that gets um, used at the point of uh, use under the sink, under the uh, tub, under the actual appliance. Um, we've had a lot of different versions of this, a lot of different sizes of this, with a lot of different options for uh, connections, uh, temperature gauges that you can put in it to make sure that you've got this adjusted and set up properly so um, you don't have a uh, over temperature condition. A fairly new product for us, what we did is we just made a nice package assembly of this. So we send you the valve available with the temperature tailpiece. Also is the T that goes on the other side of the tank for the cold water. It comes with the jumper hose. It makes it really easy for you to install it. It also on the back side has a connection for the um, recirculation pump if you have a domestic water recirculation pump. So that's our 520 series. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that one, it's a fairly new product for us. So that again is a 1017 listed valve, ASSC listing on that, which means it goes at the point of distribution, goes right on the top of the water heater. You can see one there, how it gets installed with the little flex hose that connects the cold to the, uh, from the uh, cold port on the inlet side of the water heater over to the mixing valve. And there's the uh, point of use valve, and this is a little mock-up I did of how that would typically be installed. So this is, as you can see in the picture, right under a, a sink, maybe under a lab sink or a, uh, a sink in a restroom, in a public restroom or something like that. So what we've done here is we've mixed the cold and the hot and the uh, outlet temperature uh, comes out of this side right here. Typically gonna be a chrome plated valve. Difference on this valve, it's kind of a tamper proof uh, knob on it. So if you wanna make a, an adjustment to this valve, you would have to pop that off. Ours happens to have a wrench built in the top of it. So you can make an, a, a change in the adjustment on that, but uh, won't be able to be set over 120 degrees as a final protection mechanism. Now, this is a valve that we're really proud of. This is a new uh, product for us also. <clears throat> this is an electronic mixing valve. So this is gonna, accomplish the same thing. It's gonna give you accurate temperature uh, blending for domestic water protection, but it also can give you anti-legionella function where now that we've got an actuator with a microprocessor driving it, we can tell this valve to go to a certain uh, position or condition where we could uh, increase the temperature and do a high temperature anti-legionella protection. So check this out if you haven't looked at this. We've got some good online training. Kevin, I think covered this on a webinar recently if you wanna go back and review that. But this I think is gonna be a, a game changer in our industry in that it can do multiple things. It's got a high flow, high CV valve. So uh, check it out. That's gonna become more and more important as we see more uh, Legionella issues um, being addressed with different jurisdictions and different codes like the, uh, um, the ASHRAE, uh, was it uh, 188, I think, standard. Pressure reducing valve, simply gonna reduce the pressure coming into a safe operating pressure in your building, in your home. Typically 75 pounds pressure max is what most codes are saying these days. And once you make sure you stay below that, that's gonna assure that your toilets and your faucets and everything are happy with that condition. Um, this is the valve that um, we offer that has a gauge on it, just right here. Um, also has a uh, strainer around it. This can be used as a, uh, a boiler feed valve to a lower pressure setting on this valve. So it might be used as a combination that we show here with the, the reduced pressure type of backflow preventer and the uh, 
pressure reducing valve for boiler fill applications. Again, gives you the highest level of backflow protection if you're going to use this on a boiler that has maybe glycol or something in it that you want to be absolutely certain that you've got the uh, the highest condition. Uh, I think condition number three of backflow protect, uh, protection would be with the RPZ type of uh, backflow preventer. Gauge is handy on that too. It offers you some ability to troubleshoot and make sure you've got it, it dialed in properly. Probably a little bit of a stretch to call this a safety device, really no listings on this valve. What this valve is intended to do, we sell a lot of these into the uh, wood heater market, wood fired boiler market in, uh, in Europe. This is protecting your boiler, so it wants to make sure that your boiler doesn't see a return temperature below a certain uh, whatever temperature you buy, let's say 130 degrees. It is a safety device in that it protects the temperature uh, to the boiler so you don't get flue gas condensation, so you don't get creosote buildup in it. Um, we do have some of our uh, our contractors use this to protect oil fired boilers, for example. If they're running in the cold conditions, this will assure that that boiler never um, sees cold conditions. We sell it as a standalone valve in the 280 series in two different sizes, I think inch and inch and quarter. We also have it available with a uh, circulator pump built into it. So that being in this picture here, that becomes your boiler distribution pump as well as your uh, circulation through your boiler and your internal temperature protection on one nice clean package for you. So. I think I'm about to the end here. So this is an example where that valve, uh, thanks to Nathan White up there in uh, Kenai, Alaska, you can see he's got this valve on the back of um, uh, three different oil fired boilers that he put into a job up there that's making sure that the, you can see the pumps up here, return protection valves on every one of those uh, boilers that are piped together on a, I think a application up in the oil field there somewhere, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, one more. I did add this one in. So this one again is a um, electric switch. This is what's called a thermal disc switch. So basically, it's a bimetal uh, little disc in here that, when it senses temperature, it just distorts and it snaps and it moves a little micro switch inside there and it shuts off the power. Uh, this is typically found in electric water heaters. You'll see one at the top here. That's going to be your high limit resettable. This is going to be your bother thermostat. Super simple. Uh, you'll see them on kick space heaters sometimes. Uh, it can be used as the F or L, and what I mean by that, it can make on temperature um, rise or it can break on temperature rise. So if it's a limit, you want to break it when the temperature goes too high, it shuts off your uh, your device, or if you're using it to turn on a fan, like in a kick space heater, it would be an F rating, different temperatures, uh, different sizes. Um, probably the most common applications are kick space heater and fan coils. Whew, how'd I do? Bob, I have one question yeah. for you that came in, I think earlier we missed. Maybe okay. you address this. Um, why do ASME rated tanks, I think we're talking about um, storage type water heaters, have to have a 150 PSI rating rather than 125 PSI? Yeah, I think you mean ASSE. Um, or AS, ASME is right, yeah. So basically when you build a tank to an ASME standard, a couple things have to happen is number one, it has to, every single product that goes into it, every nut, bolt, piece of steel and everything has to be documented and followed all the way through the device of that, the welders, everybody. So that's typically gonna be a, a tank that's gonna be specified for an engineer for a certain application. Usually commercial products are gonna have all ASME um, stamped uh, requirement on their thing. So that's a vessel that would be tested and, and rated for, um, would get that HV sticker put on the side of it. Now, when I say that, uh, also air compressor tanks will have an ASME uh, shield or stamp on them. Uh, same thing with LP tanks, it's a different stamp. It won't be an HV, but it'll also be a pressure rated vessel. So a typical water heater won't have, a residential type of water heater won't have an ASME uh, tank uh, a stamp on it, HV stamp on it. So um, that's why you want to make sure that you're protecting that vessel. Like I say, 50% of what the, the uh, test pressure on that vessel was is what the relief valve should be. So if the vessel was in fact tested, it would say on the vessel somewhere in the installation manual 300 PSI. Now they use a 50% rule on that to uh, come up with the, uh, the pressure setting on the relief. I think I did talk about that a little bit earlier. I kind of forgot already what I covered, but that's how they come up with that 150 PSI um, rating on a valve for a typical a domestic uh, water heater. Bob, I think that's it. So great job. So I'll hand it back to you just to wrap up.
Yeah, well, thanks everybody for attending again. Let us know whatever is on your mind as far as other topics that we can cover. If any of you are interested in coming and do a webinar um, with us, we you're glad to have you. Send in your, your topics or what you want to talk about, and we'll find a place for you to come in for our schedule. We're pretty well booked up for, I think, the rest of this year, but um, we'd like to hear from all of you. And thanks again. Thanks to my team in Milwaukee. Thanks to Mary, who uh, covers all the uh, dot and the I's and crossing the T's for me. And uh, we'll see you on the next one, folks. Bye-bye.